My dad would always tell the same story around this time of year, around the back to school time. There's a story about his high school science teacher. In short, she infuriated him. She infuriated him because she wouldn't answer his questions. Every time he approached her desk with a problem, she responded with the same litany. Well, have you checked your notes? My dad would sigh, go to his seat, check his notes, and then often return. Well, have you talked to your lab partner? My dad would sigh, go to his seat, talk with his lab partner, and often return. Well, have you looked in the textbook? Exasperated sigh, turn, look through the textbook. Now, nine times out of ten, my dad would figure it out. But should he not, he would return to her desk a final time, at which point she would walk him through the answer. My dad hated this process. He just couldn't understand why she wouldn't tell him what he wanted to know. Was that so hard? It took him all year in her class to realize what this teacher was doing. She wasn't just teaching him science. She was teaching him how to learn. Which is how, in the end, she became one of his favorite teachers. She taught my dad how to be curious. She taught him to seek out answers for himself. She's taught him to enjoy the process, not just the end point. She made him a lifelong learner. That's what Psalm 119 is all about. It's about being a lifelong learner, a lifelong learner of God. The poet behind this psalm loves to learn. I imagine the poet's a bit of a nerd like me, gets excited in the fall, even if you're not going back to school, excited for new notebooks and new pens and new highlighters, gets excited to open up a bunch of commentaries and flip through them. This poet loves to learn. This psalm is an ode. It's a love poem to the process of studying, of studying God's word. The poet writes, teach me, O Lord, your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. This poet is so in love with learning about God that they've written the longest psalm in the canon, 176 verses in total. This poet is so in love with learning that they've crafted this psalm as an acrostic. Each stanza starts with the subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Tav. This psalm is finely detailed, lovingly and painstakingly crafted. Psalm 119 is often talked about as the psalm that teaches us how to read all the other psalms. It's a love letter to learning about God that in itself teaches us how to learn about God. 
And one of the first things that Psalm 119 teaches us is that learning about God is a delight. A delight. Now, in order to best understand this quality of delight, we need to situate this psalm within its Jewish context. We need to understand how Jewish communities then and now approach Torah or the law. Psalm 119 is a love letter to learning, but even more specifically, it is a love letter to learning from and about the Torah. The written Torah comprises the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and it holds within it the law of Moses. If you read all 176 verses, you'll find that the poet refers to it by multiple names. The law, commandments, statutes, precepts, ordinances, decrees. The concept of the law can sometimes be confusing for Christians. As followers of the New Testament, we understand that we are not called to follow many of the laws found within the Hebrew Bible. At the same time, we honor others like the Ten Commandments that are found in the book of Exodus. Add to this confusion the unfortunate truth that the law is often talked about from an anti-Jewish perspective. Some Christian theologies frame the law as outdated, even negative or bad. I think it's important to recognize that we, as Christians, can understand ourselves as part of the covenant created with God through Christ, and at the same time understand the importance the law has for our Jewish siblings. Again, this is not only important for interfaith work, it's important for understanding our shared texts, texts like the one before us today. We need to understand something about Torah to understand the delight of Psalm 119. Torah, within Judaism, is understood as a profound gift from God. The law, it's a way of learning about and encountering God. It is something to be followed, but also something to be studied and interpreted and meditated on. Speaking of back to school, I have all of my notebooks from divinity school and social work school, I can't bring myself to part with them. I've carried them around because I, I always think, okay, there's going to be a day when I need to go back and I need to read my notes. And that day came this week. I felt very validated because I remembered that when I was in divinity school, I took a class on something called Midrash from Professor Michael Fishbane. And I will say, it, it took me a while to find my notes. They were not well labeled. But I found them, and I, I read through them. I read through my notes about how Midrash is this process within Judaism for encountering scripture. It is, in the words of my professor, a quest for God taken through textual study. Midrash is a way of reading Torah that looks at every little detail. It reads the text for its narrative and its wider context, but it doesn't stop there. It also reads for what is lying beneath the text, beyond the text. Midrash looks at Every single word, every single letter, even every single vowel marking as a potential holder of meaning. 
I went back to these notes because I remembered thinking at the time how this process is just infused with curiosity and delight. Like a lover poring over the handwriting of her beloved, Midrash seeks God in every brushstroke on the page. That's the sort of delight that the poet describes in Psalm 119. A delight that can spend hours meditating on a single verse, even a single word, looking for a new revelation about God. It's the sort of delight that Jesus himself took in learning about God through Torah and through scripture. We only have one story of Jesus as a child, but I think it's a back to school story. It's about learning. It goes like this. Jesus and his family travel to visit the temple in Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. But on the way back home, Jesus' parents realize that Jesus is missing. Cue paternal panic. They rush back to the city and they look for Jesus. They look for him for three days. And they finally find 12-year-old Jesus sitting in the temple, hanging out with the teachers and talking Torah. Jesus took delight, even as a small child in learning about God. Another thing that Psalm 119 teaches us is that this delight, it involves our whole selves. The poet talks about learning as a full body experience. Listen to these verses. Verse 10. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. Verse 32, I run the way of your commandments, for you enlarge my understanding. Verse 27, I find my delight in your commandments because I love them. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey on the tongue. Verse 105, and maybe this one is familiar to you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word, it isn't just about our minds. It's about our hearts. It's about our feet. It's even about our taste buds. Learning about God is a delight. A delight that involves every single part of our being. Where do you find such delight? Do you find such delight? We can learn about God in so many ways. Studying scripture is one way, clearly one that I love. But it's not the only way. Perhaps your way of learning about God is through music, or prayer, or worship. Walking in nature, moving your body, and remembering that it's a good creation. Or perhaps your way is through service, doing something with your hands, or through literature.
literature or through art or through the pursuit of justice. But whatever the medium, we should pursue lifelong learning about God. Learning that fills us with delight. Learning that engages our full selves. I think sometimes that there's this perception that religious practices, religious learning is confining. That it's confining, restricting to follow the Ten Commandments. Or that it's confining to follow the beautiful summary that Paul provides in today's text from Romans. Love your neighbor as yourself. There can be this perception that it's confining to attend church or pray before a meal or set some time aside for studying on your own. And it's true. Religious practice requires something of us. It asks for commitments. You're not going to get to brunch as early on a Sunday morning. But I think that this is far from constricting. I think that's a misperception. One that we sometimes apply to other religious traditions, sometimes one that gets applied to our own. You see, one of the wonderful things about God is that God is expansive. We will never know everything. God is too big. God is too broad. God is too mysterious. There will always be unanswered questions. Something that sends us back to our notes. Or back to our lab partner. Or back to our textbook. We can spend our whole lives on a quest for God and never reach the limit. Isn't that incredible? And isn't that, my friends, liberating? To be called into a process of lifelong learning about God and ourselves in relation to God that can bring us endless delight, fill our cups with joy until they overflow. So let's go back to school. Amen. <laughs>